Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Education Writers Association for this webinar on why reporters should cover middle school. I'm Lori Crouch, EWA's Assistant Director. Before we begin, let me go over some housekeeping items. If you have a question for our speakers, type them into the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Please include your name and affiliation when you ask your question, and please ask your question at any time, and we will get to it at the Q&A at the end. As soon as the webinar closes, you'll see an evaluation survey. Please complete it. Your feedback is important and helps us to improve. Um, right now, I'm pleased to introduce Kelly Field. Um, she's a freelance writer, for, and um, last year she wrote a couple of really terrific pieces on uh, middle school uh, for the Heckinger Report, and um, so we're pleased she could join us as moderator. Take it away, Kelly. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, so Lori mentioned the two pieces that I wrote for Heckinger. Um, the first explored the long-running debate over grade span configuration in the middle grades and looked at whether 11 to 14-year-olds do better in standalone, K or standalone middle schools or K through 8 schools. Um, and I, I looked at a lot of issues there, but the key takeaway was that the research is inconclusive. Um, there are some studies that suggest that students who switch schools in sixth or seventh grade experience deeper declines um, in academic achievement and sometimes in self-confidence than their peers who stay put. But there are other studies that suggest that the dip is temporary and has more to do with demographics um, and teacher experience levels than with the grade span configuration. Um, the second piece I did looked at new findings in adolescent brain development and developmental psychology and the way in that evolving knowledge is and isn't making its way into classrooms. Uh, more often is not making its way into the classroom. Researchers told me that schools should capitalize on kids' interests in their peers through cooperative learning and give them voice and choice in the work that they do Yet I found that many schools do neither of these things for both structural and pragmatic reasons. Um, so, so now I'm going to turn it over to our two panelists, um, Nancy Deutsch, from, who is the director of Youth Next and a professor at the University of Virginia, and Tanya Thompson, who is project coordinator for the Reimagining Middle Grades um, at Broward County, Florida Schools. Um, thank you both. And I think um, first Nancy is going to make a presentation um, on why it's important to pay attention to the middle grades. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see you. Um, let's see, can you see the slide? Not yet, it's a white screen. Yeah, I'm noticing that it worked when we tried it and now it is not. Let me try one more time. Hold on one moment. Uh, okay, so now I can tell that you can see the main screen. So I'm going to see if I can uh, get that. To uh, I am sorry, this worked last time, right? So let's try. You know what? We'll just do it this way. I'm going to not use my notes. And we're just going to do the main um, green this way. So how's this? There we go. So I'm going to quickly present for you um, the case for middle school. And I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. Um, but I'm happy to take questions on anything that, um, that, I, that I present as, as we, during the, during the Q&A as well. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on specifically the case for investing in young adolescents, right, since those are the students who are in our middle schools. So first, um, as we know, young adolescents um, is a, young adolescents are going through tremendous changes, right? So early adolescence is a time of tremendous changes in the brain, in the body, as well as in the social, social life. So there is a lot of upheaval and change during this period. In particular, um, the adolescent brain is really experiencing a lot of plasticity and growth. So early adolescence is second only to early childhood in terms of being a critical period for developmental and growth, development and growth, particularly brain development and growth. 
so not only is there a lot of change happening in the brain in terms of the hardwiring of particular skills, um, neurological changes, the development of, of different parts of the brain, but young people at this age are also very insensitive to the, or very sensitive to the environment. So it's not just that their brains are going through a lot of change, it's that their brains are also very sensitive to cues from the environment, which is great both, well, it's, it can be risky, right? It means they're more sensitive to stressors, but they're also more sensitive to supports. And there's tremendous growth in cognitive skills. So this is one of the reasons that middle school is really a key time. So when we think about youth's experiences in context, middle school students are really focused because of where they are in their development on their own identity development. They're thinking about who they are, who they are in the world, where they fit in and where they belong. They're also much more sensitive to peers. So they're very focused on, on their peers and on social risks and rewards in particular. They're seeking increased autonomy and independence. So they're trying to sort of grow into their own independent selves. Um, and this is all happening, as I mentioned, during a time when the brain is very, very malleable. And, and shifting and changing. So when we think about middle school, these are all the things that are happening. And these are often things that we think about where we tend to associate middle school as maybe being a more challenging time. But I'd like to sort of reframe that and say, it's not so much that it's inherently a challenging time, but it is inherently a time of great change. So just Despite the fact that these years are really critical and the second critical period after early childhood, there's actually much less investment in these years. So if you um, look at the federal education spending, which is the graph on the left, you can see that big dip. Um, so grades six through eight has much less federal spending, um, and that's mirrored in the private foundation spending as well. So there tends to be less financial investment in the middle school years. Um, but what we know is that investments in early childhood education, where a lot of that, a lot of funding has gone, um, is necessary but not sufficient. So what this is showing you is that those top graphs, the kind of purple and blue, is when there is more balanced intervention um, throughout, um, throughout childhood. So if you look at the bottom, I'm sorry, let, let me rephrase that. The purple and blue bars are the high school graduation and enrollment in college, right? So those are the positive outcomes. And the top part of that graph is balanced intervention throughout childhood, whereas the bottom is no intervention. So you can see that when we invest only in early childhood, there are increases in positive outcomes, but those positive outcomes um, there are more of them, right? Those positive outcomes are increased when we invest not just in early childhood, but throughout adolescence. Um, and this is also important because student engagement tends to drop off um, during middle school and level out. So you can see it's not just student engagement that drops across here, but active disengagement also increases, right? So you have this pattern where students, as they enter middle school and move through it, become increasingly disengaged um, from school as that moves on. And both those graphs essentially show that pattern. And that pattern is um, mirrored by grades and attendance data. So as students move through middle school, and then into high school. So the, the question I like to ask is, you know, what if we're sending the wrong message to kids about middle school, right? We tend to position this as something that is about middle school, that this is just the way that it is, and middle school students, this is a tough time, and this is what's gonna happen. But I don't think that that's true. So, so this is a picture that was drawn by my daughter about a year ago when she was eight. And it is her, her vision. This was unprompted by me, despite the work I do. She was writing a graphic novel about a girl who was entering middle school. And the girl who's wearing those kind of pinkish pants and the purple top and have these eyes that look open and terrified. It was her first day of middle school. And you can see there the, the kids behind her. There's this big row of lockers. You've got two kids making out. And you've got one kid 
beating up another kid and saying, nerd, 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 right? And when I asked her, well, why is this in it? Why is this your vision of what middle school is? She said, mom, I read books and watch TV. Right? So this is the message that we send to kids about middle school. But I think this, this is the wrong message because if we tell kids that middle school is inherently difficult, then that's what we can expect, right? That's what they're going to expect. And I think when you talk to middle school educators and you ask them, you know, what, how do people react when you say you teach middle school? They always report, they get a lot of, you know, groans, a lot of people saying, oh man, you teach middle school, right? It's the narrative that adults have set forth. Um, but in reality, I think that it's a mismatch between what, what this age group, these young adolescents need and what they're getting in school. So that's just sort of the, the my brief, um, um, quick overview of why this is a really critical period that is underinvested in, um, but at the same time has is a time of tremendous growth and opportunity. Um, so if we invest in it and if we shape middle schools that meet kids' developmental needs, I think we could really shift what we see. Um, from from middle school outcomes. I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and turn it over um, back to you, Kelly and Tanya, and then I'm happy to, to answer questions as we move on. Great. Yeah, I want to turn to Tanya now to talk about Broward County Public Schools efforts to reimagine the middle grades. Um, this goes back to 2017, as I understand it. Um, Tanya, can you describe the program for us in about three minutes to get, you know, give us the elevator pitch? Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. So my name is Tanya Thompson. Glad to be here with you all. Um, and the elevator pitch for reimagining middle grades is the, there was a superintendent gathering for the superintendents from the state of Florida. And then there was conversation about middle schools. As a result, um, the different superintendents came back to their um, counties and addressed it in different ways that they saw fit. Uh, so we came up with the Reimagining Middle Grades Initiative in which we wanted to change the experience for our middle school students. So uh, the way that we planned to do so uh, was by four different pillars, basically. Um, one was an, to offer an increased opportunity for project-based learning in classrooms, also to be keen to the student's sense of belonging, like a craving um, that they actually wanted to be at school, that they belonged at school. So that was done through um, social emotional learning, inclusion of social emotional learning, and then also increased electives and the opportunity for extracurricular activities. And what we were going at, no matter what the approach was, we wanted to be able to offer students a way for them to engage in school whether you're going to engage academically or whether you're going to engage because there's that adult who you know you you have a relationship with that you know that that's your person if you needed to go talk to them about something or if you needed to go to school or wanted to go to school because of the electives that were being offered or extracurricular activities whatever the hook was we wanted to make sure that we were intentional about offering opportunities to students so that that way they wanted to come in school wanted to come to school and be engaged in their learning. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, so my qu first question for both of you is, why is it important, if not critical, for reporters to cover middle schools? So I'll jump in quickly. Um, so, so for one, I think, um, you know, what, what we see right, what we read about, what comes to public attention is is really what ends up making policy change, right? So if you look at those, if you if you saw those slides and, and the, the underinvestment in the middle school years, one of the things that we really need to increase investment in those years is public voice, right? We need the public to be aware of why it's critical for us to be investing in middle school and to know that currently our funding really doesn't reflect the importance developmentally of this period. Um, I like to point to what happened with early childhood education. It's a very similar, you know, I think that's what we need right now for middle school, right? Um, I think the early childhood is a great model of the ways in which um, 
there was an increased focus on the importance of those years. And as that got greater coverage in, you know, outside of those early childhood researchers, but but the media started to talk about that, then suddenly you had, you know, governors sending like classical music tapes, right, to new moms. And and you got, but you got this great investment. And what's happening now with the spread of, for example, universal pre-K. So you've seen this real increase that tracks along with public awareness. Um, so I think that reporters have a critical role in that, in really helping bring that public attention. And, and I'll chime in. Um, in. In addition to the extra attention for resources and the potential policy changes that Nancy mentioned, you know, just just some some positive attention on on the power of this age. You know, if you if you talk to a middle schooler about their experience, you will be guaranteed to have a conversation that you were not expecting to have. You know, I think a lot of times middle schoolers are probably um, underestimated. Um, you probably think, you know, of your typical middle schooler who, who may not be one for many words or something like that. But if, if you speak to enough middle schoolers, you'll notice how you'll find some who are enlightened. You'll find some who are excited um, about their learning and would love to share their experience. You know, and I think sharing those positive experiences about um, what their actually life, what their life is actually like. I think will change the lens of the perception of, of the adults and potentially the role that, that they could play. I think they're a very influential group, both the students and the adults that interact with them um, on a daily basis. Great. Um, Tanya, question for you specifically. What have been the challenges of implementing some of these changes that you're trying to make in a systemic way? Um, I would think teacher training has got to be among them. Yeah, so we're we're the the rock that we're trying to lift here in middle school is we're trying to incorporate more project-based learning and we're trying to incorporate more social emotional learning, more connectedness between the, the the students and the adults. Both of those require a mindset shift on behalf of the adults. It's not easy, okay? Um, because a lot of teachers teach as they were taught. So this whole experience about project-based learning and relinquishing the control to the students, some teachers may not be too good on that, right? And, and that may be hard for them. So that mindset shift is, is a challenge. Um, but teacher training is one of the, the challenges in that. Um, and really, it's also tied to teacher turnover. Because as we invest dollars in training teachers and providing follow-ups and supports and things like that, if people get the training or they get the learning and then they they leave to another career or to another level, you know, it's it's hard now to find your new champions, to find your new cheerleaders and actually still be able to sustain that within a building. Um, and also I would I would say the the actual quality of the teacher is 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 a topic of conversation as well, because we have so many people coming to us to teach with alternative certifications who did not necessarily go through a traditional teaching program, that that also has an impact on the quality of instruction or pedagogical approaches just because of lack of exposure. So, um, you know, you, you can't influence the classroom without making the impact on the teacher first, but there are so many different mm -hmm. things that we're up against um, with the program as we're trying to implement it uh, just because of the, the nature of the state of education right now during this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I was just reading an article in, in Hechinger actually about how many science teachers at the middle grades have alternative certifications. Um, are there more middle school teachers in general that have these certifications or that aren't certified in you know, the subject they teach? Is there any evidence of, of that? Do either of you know? Um, and if, is there any evidence that turnover is higher at the middle grades? I don't know, Tanya. And, do you know Tanya, anything? You can just speak to your yeah. personal experience, I guess, um, from your oh, from your district. So, um, you know, obviously, the the alternative certifications is um, is something that's more common in the middle and the high school areas because mm -hmm. it's easier to translate a, a degree that someone may have obtained in just a general subject area, you know, and then become a teacher of that. Um, you know, so that that is something. And as a matter of fact, our district has made a concerted effort to try to cater to that population by helping them with different uh, course, uh, 
different ways to obtain their certification or different courses to help them um, complete anything so that that way they can obtain their certification. Uh, you know, so so that is that is common in in middle school. And I would also say um, high school. And as far as the teacher turnover, I wasn't able to, um, to necessarily find anything out as a district overall, you know, I know in terms of schools and, and their experiences, yeah, it's it's something that's that's very real. And I guess I can gauge it because when I look at the number of teachers that are trained in either project-based learning or social emotional learning, the number dwindles, right? And then it's just it's just um, something that the principal or the or the school team needs to work with in order to um, build, continue building that capacity. Nancy, did you want to add anything sort of from a national perspective or? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I don't know the numbers about turnover, but I think, um, I think first of all, the alternative certification is, is probably something that's going to actually only increase, right, as we're facing major teaching shortages and that people are trying to figure out how to get people into classrooms. Um, my suspicion is that we'll see actually larger numbers of teachers with alternative routes to the classroom. Um, and I think what's important there when we think in particular about middle school um, is, is that when the focus is on that content training, um, that's important, but that's only one piece of teaching. Um, and when you're a teacher, you have to teach the whole child. Um, and we really know a lot about the ways in which teacher-student relationships are at the heart of teaching. Um, and really understanding that young person developmentally is is really key to being able to build a strong relationship and be able to engage in teaching practices that map onto how these early adolescents are learning and engaging in the world. Yeah, and so when we're talking about traditional teacher preparation, our program, I'm taking into account what the science tells us about the early adolescent's brain and, and developmental psychology. Yeah, well, great question. So um, there are actually only, I think it's eight states, I believe, that require specific middle school licensure. So for all other states and Washington, D.C., middle school teachers um, get either elementary or secondary licenses. And so in many states, you can teach middle school with either an elementary or a secondary license with then specific content licensure. Um, so what that means is that most middle school um, teachers are not coming into the middle school classroom with specific developmental training on what the science says about young adolescents. There are some middle school specific training programs um, within universities. Um, they're not terribly widespread. Um, those that exist tend to focus on academic content knowledge and pedagogy for the middle grades, not necessarily the developmental background. Um, so it's fairly common for you know, teacher programs to have maybe one developmental class, um, but there's not a lot of focus on the developmental um, stage of, of early adolescence. So there's not a lot of training on the, the sort of science of, of the adolescent brain. Yeah. Um, Tanya, why did you decide to prioritize um, social emotional learning and project based learning in your district? I, I remember when I did this, um, one of the stories I did, uh, people were talking about how there's a drop off in social emotional learning in the middle grades and how it remains important for, for kids at that age to have that um, exposure, but, but a lot of schools aren't investing in it. Yeah, there, there was a survey that really drove how we crafted um, the initiative. And the survey gave indication that students did not feel connected to school, um, speaking to that relationship between adults and students and how important that connectedness is. And then also there was another piece to that survey that was given to students when we were first starting that um, indicated that students didn't feel a great relevancy to the work that they were doing or you know, importance to the work that they were doing. So really that's that's why the focus was on on project based learning and social emotional learning. Um, and and that that has been our charge since the beginning. And really with with the work that we've been doing in the middle grades for our district, at least we've been able now to kind of help craft um, what it could look like for the district. When we first started out um, here in Broward, we didn't have a cell assessment, a social emotional learning assessment that we were using but we were using one for reimagining middle grades, but now the whole district has one. 
we didn't have a social emotional learning curriculum for the district. We were using one for reimagining middle grades, um, but now the district has one. You know, so so the work that we're doing with our middle grades has helped to influence our district in order to adopt some some district wide practices, really to impact not just the middle grade students, but really all of the students in our district as well. Yeah. Um, uh, one question just occurred to me that wasn't on our list, but I'm just curious. Um, you know, I did another piece about social emotional learning getting caught up in in the culture wars and you know, getting conflated with critical race theory. Have you gotten any pushback recently to, to your efforts to expand social emotional learning um, as a result of this, this whole conflict we're seeing sort of nationally? So uh, we we ourselves haven't, haven't um, seen any of, of that conversation take place with the work that we're doing, um, you know, but we have such a need in, in our youth that, that we're interacting with. Um, you know, that we're going to focus on on the need for the time being and continue doing what's right for the students, um, because really it's it's teaching them to um, teaching them how to be a person. Right. And, and every time I've spoken to students, they mention that to me, you know, they can't articulate quite what social emotional learning is. Right. But they'll tell me it just helps me to be a better person. You know, another student I spoke to recently talked to me about um, managing stress you know, and how middle school can be stressful, but how helpful it is now that her teachers are actually talking to her about techniques, about how to manage stress. You know, so while while all of the the, the political conversations play out, you know, we're, we, we have remained consistent in just um, staying the course and, and doing what's right to help our students just navigate this uh, stage that they're in, and, and we'll see how the cards fall. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so where do you hope to be in five years? I mean, how will you measure success and, and what can other districts learn from, from your efforts? So there's there's two different ways, right, to measure success. One, of course, is with the hard data. Um, you know, we have had cell assessment data, um, social emotional learning data that really gives us a, a snapshot of where our students are. Um, and we have the baseline data back from 2018. So we basically have at this point four years worth of snapshots that allow us to see how the different groups of students have progressed during um, their exposure with reimagining middle grades during the stage. So what we would like to see when you look at the hard data is compared to where we were with our baseline, we would like to see the increase in the different social emotional learning competencies um, throughout the years, right? That would that would be ideal. And, and how optimistic it was for us in the second year of our initiative, comparing year one to year two, our trend was actually upward. But then you know how that story goes. Then COVID came, you know, and then of course now we're trying to recover from there and really, um, you know, continue to to see if we can actually do the upward um, trend in, in spite of all the mitigating circumstances that schools are dealing with. So that's what the data piece, right? Um, the other the other thing, like if anecdotally, I was just to kind of define where we would be five years from now, the what is always going to be there. The standards are always going to be there. I think what we're trying to get at here with reimagining middle grades is the how um, that's actually taught, you know, and we would like for the instruction to be something that aligns with the students' developmental needs. Um, you know, you had mentioned voice and choice earlier. Um, in one of your in one of your remarks, but letting that be um, evident in the instruction. Also, having um, topics or questions that are authentic, relevant, connected to a challenging problem or question. Um, allowing for feedback and revision, kind of just that, that process of of improvement during um, their work cycle, in order to actually get to a better product that they can then share or showcase with the public, in order to really enlighten others as to what the process was for their learning you know and really in terms of the other side when you look at the, the social emotional learning piece you know we would love for there to be collaboration between um, the classroom itself the school in which it's in and then also the communities that our students are coming from uh, you know and and i think probably at this age the the areas that students can probably grow in the most um, just given the age that they're in you know, is is responsible decision making, having students be socially aware, and also um, 
practice self-management. You know, and it's not no, it's not it's not necessarily that now they're going to be perfect young adolescents and now they're not going to make mistakes. But I think it's also creating an environment that if you do make a mistake, we're going to teach you, you know, what you could have done so that that way, should you be in that situation again, then, you know, you'll 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 better navigate that whole um, ordeal and how it plays out. So really even seeing mistakes as an opportunity to learn um, would be a great indication that, you know, we've actually made it. And, and have made progress in, in the work that we're doing. Right, great, thanks. Um, so Nancy, you, you talked about, you showed a couple of slides um, illustrating the drop in grades and attendance in the middle school, or in the middle grades, um, that lead to even greater disengagement by high schools. Um, in what ways are schools failing to engage this age group? Um, and is there, you, and you mentioned this mismatch actually, um, you know, this, this age develop, with it, there's a another term for it. I can't remember right now. Maybe you yes, can remind age me. Age environment fit. Yes, age environment fit. Um, that goes back to Eckley's research, I think, um, from from a time ago. Um, you know, why? Where does this misalignment show up? Um, you know, where are some sort of concrete ways in which we can see this this mismatch, and um, and why is it happening? Yeah, so so you're right. So it goes back to work by Jackie Eccles and her colleagues who coined the term stage environment fit, where what, and it was actually some research they were doing on middle school age students, and they sort of were documenting these drops in engagement, drops in in other things like so like self esteem, particularly for girls, um, and you know, and I think their their sort of hypothesis was that there was this mismatch between again what what young people at this age needed and what the setting was providing them. And so I think and and I and I think this is correct. And I think some of the things that Tanya has mentioned are direct ways that schools are trying to correct that, right? So some of the places where we see this mismatch is often traditionally as students moved into middle school and also I'll say there's been a shift in language right so like when I was growing up I went to a junior high school right um, and in fact the main part of the school was basically just that it was a mini high school right it was set up the same way you went from classroom to classroom um, I, and it was you know just the, the it was a public middle school was the kind of min, the high school junior literally junior high um, I happened to be in what was sort of now looking back, I realized the experimental cluster, like from the middle school movement of that time period of trying to realign um, those grades with what students need. And so we were in uh, a more open cluster. We had a team of four teachers. We didn't move across classrooms and teachers all day. We rotated between the four subject area teachers. Um, and but it was the same larger group of kids, right? So we were split into four groups who kind of rotated between classes, but then we all came together throughout the day. We were almost like a school within the school. We we worked closely with these four teachers, right? Um, and we did a lot as a community. Um, and those are a lot of the things that I think actually helped meet many of our needs, right? You still had a strong need for a sense of for a sense of belonging, for close relationships with teachers. When you think about um, what I talked about at the very beginning, all of the ch changes that are occurring in young adolescents, um, and young adolescents do say, seek novelty, they seek, right? But they also need some stability, right? There's lots of change happening in their brains, in their bodies, in their social networks. Um, and so having some stability in the school day, right? Knowing, okay, this is where I'm going. These are the relationships I can build. Um, young people are also seek, seeking a lot of um, autonomy and independence, right? Um, and if you think traditionally about as students moving to middle school and high school, um, there's actually oftentimes much more stringent focus on content and in a not necessarily voice and choice way, right? It's sort of like this, now we're really focused on these particular academic content standards. Um, and so things like project-based learning that Tanya was talking about, right? More individualized learning where students have some choice about how are they going to master the skills that they need to master in this content area or the knowledge that they need to master in this content area in ways that also 
meet them, meet, you know, meet their interests and needs. There's also an increased desire for sort of having real world, understanding real world implications of the work and being connected to, to, to meaning in meaningful ways to knowledge. So how do we kind of make, um, make relevant right, the content? How do we give them opportunities to engage in projects that have real world impact? Right. They're thinking a lot about identity, again, who they are in the world, who they are, um, um, who they're going to be in the world. And so helping them them um, have opportunities for see, developing a sense of purpose in relation to their identity through the curriculum is important. And I think those are not necessarily things that we have done in middle school. Um, and so you start to see this like disengagement. Um, as what they're trying to do, the focus on their on peers and on social risk and rewards, right? Um, I think that traditionally we see a lot of the social risk and we don't necessarily within schools take advantage of being able to draw on the desire for, for positive peer relationships and, and social rewards sort of in the intellectual work of the schools. Yeah, what you were talking about sounds like similar to what they do at my daughter's school. She's in sixth grade. They have a teams approach um, where there's this, this four teachers and they work with, you know, there's four teams and, and they each have their own set of teachers. Um, how widespread is that? You know, is that common for schools to do that? And another thing that, that they do that I've heard, uh, I've heard about in other schools is, is advisory and that being a way to create some stability for kids. And, um, and both of these sort of as being a way to ease the transition from elementary where you're with one teacher all the time, you, you're a stable core. You know, a stable peer group um, versus being thrown into like this this larger school environment and moving around all the time. Um, how widespread are those sort of practices? Yeah, great question. I might let Tanya speak to how widespread it is from her experience with peers in the field. Um, okay. I, you know, I will say say quickly the advisory period I think is a really important opportunity. Um, I know, so for example, um, locally, there's a county that's revisioning or, um, its advisory period and actually seeing that as a time to really engage with um, early adolescent identity development. And so they're actually shaping this whole advisory curriculum that will go across the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades of the middle school um, that's going to get engage young people in sort of youth participatory action research. So both helping them sort of learn skills to engage in research on social issues they care about while also engaging in identity work and thinking about who they are while also providing this opportunity to build relationships both with their peers and their teachers. And um, I think that's a great way to think about those, those periods and uses. Tanya, I don't know if you have thoughts based on what you know about districts across the country and uh, um, structuring. Yeah, I, I do actually. Um, as far as the advisory period, you know, for us at least in, in Broward, something as an advisory is a cost neutral um, measure to implement into the master schedule because you just shave off some some minutes from passing time and you just create a block at the beginning of, of the of the day. Um, you know, but I think it comes with intentionality and it comes with visioning with your staff. Um, because it can really be a time to put to good use and really have an opportunity where adults and students can engage in meaningful um, conversations or be directed towards a meaningful activity or a meaningful outcome. Um, you know, but if not used properly, of course, you know, it, it can just be something where everybody's just sitting there waiting for the bell to ring. You know, and we, we have had a couple of schools now try to start that um, homeroom period or that advisory period uh, where they create, much like Nancy was saying about the curriculum, um, they create the curriculum, they create the, the training opportunities for the teachers to understand. And it really does help in terms of having a, a, a safe place for the students and the adults to kind of come together. And as far as teaming here in our district, at least in the middle schools, we kind of moved away from teaming for a little bit because it wasn't fiscally possible. But now we have some schools that are now moving back to teaming, you know, and, and when someone is able to purely team again now in this day and age, it's kind of like a bragging right, you know, because they were able to go back to teaming, um, you know, because really that's what that's what middle school, that's what you think of when you think of, of middle schools. And it really does help to have a, a shared group of students between four teachers. And I mean, I, when I was a middle school teacher, I remember being on a, 
uh, when I was a middle school teacher, I remember being on a middle school team and we would have these conversations about, oh, little Johnny's doing this for me. He's not doing anything for me. What is he doing? Oh, he's fine for me. He does everything for me. Well, what am I doing that, he, you know, that I need to copy from you, you know? So it really does allow for those adults to have um, direct conversations with those shared students about what commonalities we may see or not see across the different classrooms. So that, that collaboration to have it come back um, is, is also welcomed in, in our space. And we're starting to, to invite schools to, to hold it as a best practice and um, have it be across um, middle schools. Great. Um, Lori, how are we doing on time? Doing great. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so Nancy, um, another one of your slides was showing that middle school receives fewer dollars than any other grouping. Um, what are the implications of that lack of resources? Um, I noticed that the, the next phase, um, uh, high school, is, is also not particularly well funded, especially relative to elementary school. Yeah. So there are a few implications. One of them is, as Tanya mentioned, right? Like, how can you staff up a middle school so that you actually can have best practices, right? So is it fiscally possible to um, to to do teaming, for example, right? Um, another one comes into play with professional development, right? So as we, as we noted earlier, there are, you know, most middle school teachers have not had training specifically in early adolescent development. Um, and with a lack of resources comes lack of opportunities to, to you know, dedicate time and resources to that additional development and, and, and um, knowledge training. Um, and then also quite just, just in terms of re resources and buildings, right? Um, if you think about the in, that investment dollars also affects the buildings that kids are in, and you know, we sometimes don't take this very seriously, but the buildings that kids are in send a message. And what's interesting is that during early adolescence, kids become particularly attuned to to environment writ, writ large. I mean that not just physical environment, but social environment, but they also become attuned to issues of fairness and justice, right? And they are taking in cues from the world about who they are and how people see them. So when you have communities where, you know, the middle school is the oldest building, it's known to be kind of dilapidated, struggles, that sends a message to the kids who are walking in that door, right? About their value to the community. Um, and those values are internalized. I mean, this is the time period when kids are taking all those messages and saying, this is how the world sees me. Um, particularly when you think about how that also distributes across communities within a larger district, right? So if you're thinking about kids from historically marginalized backgrounds, lower financially resourced communities, when they're seeing those inequities, that's telling them something. Um, and I think that that's something that adults really need to pay attention to. So I think all of those things together means that you both have physical spaces um, but then also just um, staffing and resources that may not allow people to be doing the best possible developmentally aligned um, work with young adolescents. Right, right. Um, in what ways has, has the COVID pandemic disrupted some of the key developmental milestones of adolescents, um, like autonomy building, independent seeking? Um, exploration, all these things are sort of hallmarks of, of the, those years. Um, and what role should schools be playing in helping them um, recover, not just academically, but, you know, social, emotionally as well? I can speak from, from our experience um, that, you know, there, there has been a huge disruption to the culture and, and the community, you know, um, as it relates to the impact of, of COVID, you know, and I really do think that there is a role for the social emotional learning um, through explicit ex instruction to actually play a role in, in helping us to achieve a new normal, along with the project-based learning opportunities that, that I had mentioned before. You know, there's, there's concern about relationship um, building, 
um, social awareness. And those are really things that, that were disrupted because of the pandemic and the isolation that students felt as a result of um, just relying on technology. And then also probably has something to do too with the technology consumption or the over technology consumption that students have where they now can't even relate to each other as people because they're busy relating to each other through their devices, you know? Um, so much like Nancy had mentioned routines, you know, um, and how important routines are in, in this age, you know, children at, at, at this age, they rely on routines. I think routines give them that structure, the predictability, um, and let them know what's coming. Um, you know, but I, I think as, as schools and stakeholders in schools, I think it's always important also to be keen to listen to students as your as your stakeholder, but that way you also can be malleable and kind of adapt and, and help them um, with whatever needs they may make you aware of that perhaps were not even on your radar. You know, and I think we need to continue incorporating social emotional learning um, on, a, on a regular basis. And we need to really provide outlets, uh, instructional outlets, where students can also develop socially as well as grow academically. Uh, you know, but I, I don't want to just put a plug in for the role of social emotional learning for students um, alone. You know, I want to continue making space for social emotional learning for adults. You know, um, I think I think the adults can only take care of the students when the adults are taking care of themselves. Um, you know, so that SEL piece for adults in schools is something that also um, has to be uh, paid attention to as well. Uh, so that that way, it's just a community that that everybody is there for for the same reason. Yeah, and and I would just um, add to that. That I think you know one thing that um, the, during during young early adolescence, right, the independence and autonomy seeking that that's really there. Um, th this affected kids differently, right? But in general, uh, probably most middle school students spent far more time with their parents than they would have otherwise in the last few years. Um, they also there were there's a lot of identity development, obviously. I've mentioned that multiple times, right? Exploration that goes on. A lot of that happens in extracurricular activities, many of which were curtailed during the last couple of years. So there hasn't been necessarily as much external exploration. Um, as there, there typically may have been. At the same time, for some students, right, um, particularly for students who were experiencing financial hardship in their families because of the pandemic or were experiencing family, you know, death or illness, they may have actually been taking on greater adult roles or greater independent roles as they work to support their family. So I think we also don't want to make the assumption that it was the same for everybody, but that wherever you were, whatever your position was, it, it certainly affected where these middle school students, how they were experiencing um, the world, um, leaning them either perhaps more into adulthood or more into childhood, depending on, on their circumstances. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Lori, is your appearance a signal that we're ready to move on to the audience questions? Yes, we, we have a very important question from uh, uh, Peggy Perdue of the Corvallis, Oregon Advocate. Um, she asks, Nancy, where did you get the, what's, where's the source of the information you had in the slide about resources being less money spent on middle schools? Yeah, great question. Hold on, and I will pull it, pull that up. So um, there are, well, I'm pulling it up on my computer. I won't pull it up for you again, but I'm pulling it up to make sure I get my sourcing right here. So the source on the federal education spending, and I will say that the federal education is, is a bit dated now. That's from fiscal year 2015, but it was from the Alliance for Excellent Education. They have a report called Never Too Late, why um, ESEA must fill the missing middle. And that was uh, that came out in May 2015. And then the private foundation money, um, that tracked grants made between 2011 and 2017. And that was from um, the Civic, Civic Enterprises, their report on middle grades funding overview from October 2018. And I'm, so, I'm happy to share those. 
And so obviously somebody needs to start uh, tracking it in more recent years as well. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly, I think now as we think about looking at, I think it'll be very interesting to see where um, pandemic recovery money is going also as schools, as school districts get that and where those funds are being spent. Right. Um, so what are, what are some questions that reporters should be asking their school districts about, um, you know, what, what their plans are for middle schools and how they approach middle schools and middle grade students? Um, I'll let Tanya yeah. answer that first, because I would love to hear from her being district situated. Like, what does she wish people would ask her? I, I would, I would be, um, I'm missing the word, but I, I would like for, um, I would like to be able to share with others about the, the like the instructional methods that we're actually using to leverage this age group. Um, and I would also love to elaborate the opportunities that we're offering to students really to kind of capitalize on, on their strengths as well. Yeah, yes, and, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll just add, I, I think um, the other thing I would add to that is um, Tanya made reference early on about how listening to the voices of middle school students themselves is really powerful. And I would also encourage reporters to do that. Um, I actually heard this wonderful report. Um, it, it was on NPR. I can't remember which program it, it, it may have been just you know, morning edition or all things considered, but where they were it, a middle school student talking about um, their experience during the pandemic, right? And, and what it was and it, it you know, um, and I actually did do it, even as someone who works, you know, in, in this area, I did a middle, uh, middle take, I did, I did a double take when I was like, wait, this was a middle school student talking. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I think, um, you know, as Tanya said earlier, when you really take time to talk to and listen to the students about their experiences, you really gain so much more. Um, and I think also focusing on some of the the bright spots. I think that, you know, as I, there's a reason I put up that picture that my daughter drew, right? And it's because I think the power of media is great in shaping kids' expectations for schooling. And I think when we really go in and shift to, to highlighting, you know, what are the great things that are happening in middle schools? What are some of the terrific things that Tanya and her team have put in place at Broward and the ways in which you can see the students' excitement and engagement in that. You know, I think that's really powerful because it also gives other schools a model and lets and gives kids a vision of what school can be like for them. And perhaps um, portraying middle school students as more than their negative side <laughs> would be a good thing too. <laughs> Um, a, f a question from Jenna Russell at the Boston Globe. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of identity development through extracurriculars and wonder if you generally see more extracurricular opportunities for middle school schoolers in K-8 schools or in 6-8 configurations. I, I can speak at least. Go Tanya, good. Sorry, <laughs> I can speak at least for our district. Um, the K-8 is set up a little differently than a six to eight. The K-8 tends to have a smaller middle school than a traditional six through eight. Um, you know, so so obviously there's power in numbers. Um, you know, I can tell you that a traditional middle school in terms of the extracurriculars that are offered at a, at a traditional middle school, there is a club for everything. You know, and I mean, it, it's almost like the teachers also appreciate having that outlet um, where they can actually meet with a group of like-minded students who have the same interests perhaps as them, that they can actually have um, time in the afternoon after school to have a, a ghouls and goblins club, you know, or an anime club or whatever that may be. Um, you know, but I can tell you that at least on, on our side for the district, there's only certain extracurriculars that are sponsored, right? And then from there, um, in terms of sports and actual clubs. And then from there, if it's a sport that's not sponsored, then the school would have to pursue an outside booster club. Or if it's an extra curriculum, or if it's a club that's not sponsored, then the teacher would have to do that 
out of the willingness of his or her heart because they they're not given a stipend you know so some some funding there um you know to really be able to leverage the interest of the students but also you know hold some esteem for the educators who are willing to devote some time to spend with these students on this interest would be helpful as well yeah and and i think you know, I, I don't know if there's national data on which, you know, where there's more more or less, but I'll say in general, so I actually have done a lot of work within the after school field, like an after school and out of school time programming, you know, and in general, I think um, oftentimes for the younger grades for elementary, that kind of after school programming is, is much more around the, um, childcare and the needs of parents, right? Um, and you also sometimes have external providers, right? So there may be like elementary based after school programs and some extracurricular clubs, but um, less like the traditional extracurricular that we think about as you move up into middle school and high school, where there's really like that interest base and where kids are trying out different things. You know, I will say one thing that I think is a potential opportunity that we don't always take advantage of um, that I have seen in externally based kind of comprehensive out of school times programs, like places like boys and girls clubs, right, where there's a range of ages and a range of activities, is actually the way in which the older students can become role models and mentors to younger students in, in extracurricular activities. And I think in K-8 schools, there's actually um, kind of cool opportunities for that, for letting the middle school students take on some of those mentorship roles, which plays into identity development, right? It helps them see themselves as being role models for younger for younger kids and, and shapes how they see themselves. Yeah, that right. was one of the arguments that that I heard from proponents of K-8 schools in, in the story about grade span configuration, was that they can take on more of a leadership role. Okay, we have only a couple of minutes left. I wonder if you all um, have any concluding thoughts you would like to um, make before we close out the webinar. I'll just say thanks so much for taking time to to talk about this, for, for inviting me to talk with you all. Um, you know, and I just hope, you know, I hope through this that some of our enthusiasm for this age group and, and these grades has, has come through. Um, I really do think that there is such incredible opportunity here early adolescence is such an amazingly exciting period um, and and young people this age actually have so much capacity um, and and so I just I, I I'm really excited for middle school to get the attention that it really deserves and for middle school students to then get the schools that they so richly deserve and and I'll just share that I've earned some extra stripes this year because not only have I been a middle middle grades educator and an administrator but this year now i too am also a middle grades parent as my twin boys are now in middle school themselves and i'll piggyback off of the story that nancy has shared about her daughter with the drawing and my son in one of his classes he was watching a movie like one of those diary of a wimpy kid movies or something like that and he comes to me and he says mommy we're watching this such and such movie in this class and it's the craziest thing and I said, why? He says, middle school is nothing like that. He says, they're talking about kids getting slammed in lockers. He's like, who gets slammed in lockers, <laughs> you know? And, and it was just so, so heartwarming kind of just to see that his experience was not like it was portrayed, right? Um, but I really do think that this age is such a promising age i think that's always what i've liked about this age is the promise that it holds and i think sometimes it's overlooked um you know but but i think the more attention that we shine on this age um i think the more we'll reap in the future right like after high school and post-secondary if we invest um the right amount of time energy and people into this age age group so i i, I too would like to extend my gratitude for being able to be here and just share the experiences of what we're doing here in Broward. Kelly, any other concluding? Um, I would just put in a plug for the book Middle School Matters by Phyllis Bagel, um, who's a counselor in Maryland. And it's just a really good overview of you know, the science and, and why this is a time of opportunity. Um, you know, The title Middle School Matters gets to the fact that a lot of people think middle school doesn't matter or it's been treated as if it doesn't matter. 
Um, so for reporters looking to write on this subject, I think that's a good resource. Okay, with that, thank you, Nancy, Kelly, and Tanya for a terrific discussion. We really greatly appreciate it. Um, I wanna thank those of you who attended today. Um, I hope you came away with some great story ideas. And um, I just wanna let you know that as the webinar closes, an evaluation survey would will pop up and we'd love your feedback on this webinar. There's also a box where you can submit your own webinar ideas and we always welcome that. We take your feedback very seriously and thank you and see you next time. Thank you. Take care, thanks. <laughs>